Adelstrop by Edward Thomas. Read for LibriVox.org by Chris. Yes, I remember Adelstrop, the name, because one afternoon of heat the express train drew up there unwontedly. It was late June. The steam hissed. Someone cleared his throat. No one left and no one came. On the bare platform, what I saw was Adelstrop, only the name. And willows, willow herb, and grass, and meadow sweet, and haycocks dry, no whit less still and lonely fair than the high cloudlets in the sky. And for that minute a blackbird sang, close by and round him mistier, farther and farther all the birds of Oxfordshire and Gloucestershire. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. All That Matters by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox by Noam Beckhoffer When all that matters shall be written down, and the long record of our years is told, where sham-like flesh must perish and grow cold, when the tomb closes on our fair renown, and priest and layman, sage and motley clown, must quit the places which they dearly hold, what to our credit shall we find enscrolled? And what shall be the jewels of our crown? I fancy we shall hear to our surprise some little deeds of kindness long forgot, telling our glories and the brave and wise, deeds which we boasted often mentioned not. God gave us life not just to buy and sell, and all that matters is to live it well. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Annie Laurie by William Douglas, as amended by Lady John Scott, read for LibriVox.org by Michael Downing. Max Wilson braes a bonny where early falls the dew, and twas there that Annie Laurie gave me her promise true, gave me her promise true, which ne'er forgot would be, and for bonny Annie Laurie, I'd lay me doon in thee. Her brow is like the snowdrift, her throat is like a swan. Her face it is the fairest that e'er the sun shone on, that e'er the sun shone on, and dark blue is her e, and for bonny Annie Laurie, I'd lay me doon in thee. Like dew on the gowan lying is the far of her fairy feet, and like winds in summer sighing, her voice is low and sweet, her voice is low and sweet, and she's ah the world to me. And for bonny honey lorry, I lay me doon and thee. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Blue Symphony by John Gould Fletcher. Read for LibriVox.org by Amanda Brewer. The darkness rolls upward. The thick darkness carries with it rain and a ravel of cloud. The sun comes forth upon earth. Palely the dawn leaves me facing timidly old gardens sunken, and in the gardens is water. Somber wreck, autumnal leaves, shadowy roofs in the blue mist, and a willow branch that is broken. O oh, old pagodas of my soul! How you glittered across green trees, blue and cool, blue, tremulously, blow faint puffs of smoke across somber pools, the damp green smell of rotted wood, and a heron that cries from out the water. Through the upland meadows I go alone, for I dreamed of someone last night who is waiting for me. Flower and blossom, tell me, do you know of her? Have the rocks hidden her voice? They are very blue and still. Long upward road that is leading me, light-hearted I quit you, for the long, loose ripples of the meadow grass invite me to dance upon them. Quivering grass, 
daintily poised for her foot's tripping. O oh, blown clouds, could I only race up like you? O oh, the last slopes that are sun-drenched and steep! Look at the sky, across black valleys rise blue, white, aloft, jagged, unwrinkled mountains, ranges of death, solitude, silence. One chuckles by the brook for me, one rages under the stone. One makes a spout of his mouth, one whispers, one is gone. One over there on the water spreads cold ripples for me enticingly. The vast dark trees flow like blue veils of tears into the water. Sour sprites moaning and chuckling, what have you hidden from me? In the palace of the blue stone she lies forever, bound hand and foot. Was it the wind that rattled the reeds together, dry reeds, a faint shiver in the grasses? On the left hand there is a temple, and a palace on the right hand side. Foot passengers in scarlet pass over the glittering tide. Under the bridge the old river flows low and monotonous, day after day. I have heard and have seen all the news that has been, autumn's gold and spring's green. Now in my palace I see foot passengers crossing the river, pilgrims of autumn in the afternoons, lotus pools, petals in the water, such are my dreams. For me silks are outspread, I take my ease, unthinking. And now the lowest pine branch is drawn across the disk of the sun. Old friends who will forget me soon, I must go on towards those blue death mountains I have forgot so long. In the marsh grasses, there lies forever my last treasure, with the hope of my heart. The ice is glazing over, torn lanterns flutter, on the leaves is snow. In the frosty evening, toll the old bell for me once in the sleepy temple, perhaps my soul will hear. After glow, before the stars peep, I shall creep into the darkness. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Cold Change by Caroline Norton. Read for LibriVox.org by April Gonzalez. In the cold change which time hath wrought on love, the snowy winter of his summer prime, should the chance sigh or sudden tear drop move thy heart to memory of the olden time? Turn not to gaze in me with pitying eyes, nor mock me with a weathered hope renewed, but from the bower we both have loved, arise, and leave me to my barren solitude. What boots is that a momentary flame shoots from the ashes of a dying fire? We gaze upon the hearth from whence it came, and know the exhausted embers must expire. Therefore no pity, or my heart will break. Be cold, be callous, for thy past love's sake. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Donkey by G. K. Chesterton. Read for LibriVox.org by Noel Badrian, County Offaly, Ireland. When fishes flew and forests walked, and figs grew upon thorn some moment when the moon was blood then surely i was born with monstrous head and sickening cry and ears like errant wings the devil's walking parody on all four-footed things the tattered outlaw of the earth of ancient crooked will starve scourge deride me i am dumb I keep my secret still. Fools, for I also had my hour, one far fierce hour and sweet. There was a shout about my ears, and palms before my feet. 
End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Dreams by Eugene Field. Read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. Two dreams came down to earth one night from the realm of mist and dew. One was a dream of the old, old days, and one was a dream of the new. One was a dream of a shady lane that led to the pickerel pond, where the willows and rushes bowed themselves to the brown old hills beyond. And the people that peopled the old-time dream were pleasant and fair to see, and the dreamer he walked with them again, as often of old walked he. Oh, cool was the wind in the shady lane that tangled his curly hair. Oh, sweet was the music the robins made to the springtime everywhere. Was it the dew the dream had brought from yonder midnight skies? Or was it tears from the dear dead years that lay in the dreamer's eyes? The other dream ran fast and free, as the moon benignly shed her golden grace on the smiling face in the little trundle bed. For twas a dream of times to come, of the glorious noon of day, of the summer that follows the careless spring when the child is done with play. And twas a dream of the busy world where valorous deeds are done, of battles fought in the cause of right and of victories nobly won. It breathed no breath of the dear old home and the quiet joys of youth. It gave no glimpse of the good old friends or the old-time faith and truth. But twas a dream of youthful hopes, and fast and free it ran, and it told to a little sleeping child of a boy become a man. These were the dreams that came one night to earth from yonder sky. These were the dreams two dreamers dreamed, my little boy and I. And in our hearts my boy and I were glad that it was so. He loved to dream of days to come, and I of long ago. So from our dreams my boy and I unwillingly awoke, but neither of his precious dream unto the other spoke. Yet of the love we bore those dreams gave each his tender sign, for there was triumph in his eyes, and there were tears in mine. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Dulce et decorum est by Wilfred Owen. Read for LibriVox.org by Lubet. Bent double, like old beggars under sacks, knock kneed, coughing like hags, we cursed through sludge, till on the haunting flares we turned our backs, and towards our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched asleep. Many had lost their boots, but limped on, bloodshod. All went lame, all blind, drunk with fatigue, deaf even to the hoots of tired, outstripped five-nines that dropped behind. Gas! Gas! Quick, boys! An ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time, but someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light, as under a green sea I saw him drowning. In all my dreams, before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If in some smothering dreams you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in, and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face like a devil's sick of sin, 
If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth-corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues, my friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory the old lie, dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Early Rising by John Godfrey Sachs Read for LibriVox.org by Rhonda Fetterman God bless the man who first invented sleep, So Sancho Panza said, and so say I. And bless him also that he didn't keep his great discovery to himself, Nor try to make it, as the lucky fellow might, A close monopoly by patent right. Yes, bless the man who first invented sleep, I really can't avoid the iteration. But blast the man, with curses loud and deep, Whate'er the rascal's name, or age, or station, Who first invented and went round advising That artificial cut-off, early rising. Rise with the lark, and with the lark to bed, Observe some solemn sentimental owl. Maxims like these are very cheaply said, but ere you make yourself a fool or foul, Pray just inquire about his rise and fall, And whether larks have any beds at all. The time for honest folk to be abed Is in the morning, if I reason right, And he who cannot keep his precious head Upon his pillow till it's fairly light, And so enjoy his forty morning winks, Is up to knavery, or else he drinks thompson who sung about the seasons said it was a glorious thing to rise in season but then he said it lying in his bed at ten o'clock a m the very reason he wrote so charmingly the simple fact is his preaching wasn't sanctioned by his practice tis doubtless well to be sometimes awake awake to duty and awake to truth but when, alas, a nice review we take of our best deeds and days, we find in sooth the hours that leave the slightest cause to weep are those we passed in childhood or asleep. Tis beautiful to leave the world a while for the soft visions of the gentle night, and free at last from mortal care or guile to live as only in the angel's sight in sleep sweet realm so cosily shut in where at the worst we only dream of sin so let us sleep and give the maker praise i like the lad who when his father thought to clip his morning nap by hackneyed phrase of vagrant worm by early songster caught cried served him right it's not at all surprising the worm was punished, sir, for early rising. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Irking by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe Recorded for LibriVox.org by Renata March 2012, Colorado Who writes there so late through the night dark and drear? the father it is with his infant so dear he holdeth the boy tightly clasped in his arm he holdeth him safely he keepeth him warm my son wherefore seekst thou thy face thus to hide look father the earl king is close by our side does see not the earl king with crown and with train my son tis the mist rising over the plain O oh, come thou, dear infant, O oh, come thou with me, Full many a game I will play they with thee. On my strand lovely flowers their blossoms unfold, My mother shall grace thee with garments of gold. My father, my father, and dost thou not hear 
the words that irking now breathe in my ear be calm dearest child this thy fancy deceives tis the sad wind that sighs through the withering leaves wilt go then dear infant wilt go with me there my daughter shall tend thee with sisterly care my daughters by night their glad festival keep they dance thee and rock thee and sing thee to sleep my father my father and dost thou not see how the irking his daughters has brought here for me my darling my darling i see it aright tis the aged thy willows deceiving thy sight i love thee i am charmed by thy beauty dear boy and if thought unwilling then force i employ my father my father he seizes me fast for sorely the irking has hurt me at last the father now gallops with terror half wild he grabs in his arms the poor shuddering child he reaches his courtyard with toil and with dread the child in his arms finds him motionless death end of poem this poem is in the public domain Fears in Solitude by Samuel Taylor Coleridge Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug Perth, Western Australia A green and silent spot amid the hills A small and silent dell All still a place no singing skylark ever poised himself The hills are healthy, save that swelling slope Which hath a gay and gorgeous covering on All golden with the never bloomless firs which now blooms most profusely but the dell bathed by the mist is fresh and delicate as vernal cornfield or the unripe flax when through its half transparent stalks at eve the level sunshine glimmers with green light oh tis a quiet spirit healing nook which all methinks would love but chiefly he the humble man who in his youthful years knew just so much of folly as had made his early manhood more securely wise here he might lie on fern or withered heath while from the singing lark that sings unseen the minstrelsy that solitude loves best and from the sun and from the breezy air sweet influences trembled o'er his frame and he with many feelings many thoughts made up a meditative joy and found religious meanings in the forms of nature and so his senses gradually wrapped in a half sleep he dreams of better worlds and dreaming hears thee still o singing lark that singest like an angel in the clouds my god it is a melancholy thing for such a man who would full fain preserve his soul in calmness yet perforce must feel for all his human brethren o oh my god it weighs upon the heart that he must think what uproar and what strife may now be stirring this way or that way o'er these silent hills invasion and the thunder and the shout and all the crash of onset fear and rage an undetermined conflict even now even now perchance and in his native isle carnage and groans beneath this blessed sun we have offended o oh my countrymen we have offended very grievously and been most tyrannous from east to west a groan of accusation pierces heaven the wretched plead against us multitudes countless and vehement the sons of god our brethren like a cloud that travels on steamed up from cairo's swamps of pestilence even so my countrymen have we gone forth and borne to distant tribes slavery and pangs and deadlier still our vices whose deep taint with slow perdition murders the whole man his body and his soul meanwhile at home all individual dignity and power engulfed in courts committees institutions associations and societies a vain speech-mouthing speech-reporting guild one benefit club for mutual flattery we have drunk up demure as at a grace pollutions from the brimming cup of wealth contemptuous of all honourable rule yet bartering freedom and the poor man's life for gold as at a market 
the sweet words of Christian promise, words that even yet might stem destruction, were they wisely preached, are muttered o'er by men, whose tones proclaim how flat and wearisome they feel their trade. Rank scoffers some, but most too indolent to deem them falsehoods, or to know their truth. O oh, blasphemous! The book of life is made a superstitious instrument on which we gabble o'er the oaths we mean to break. For all must swear, all, and in every place, college and wharf, council and justice court. All, all must swear, the briber and the bribed, merchant and lawyer, senator and priest, the rich, the poor, the old man and the young. All, all make up one scheme of perjury that faith doth reel. The very name of God sounds like a juggler's charm, and bold with joy, forth from his dark and lonely hiding place, portentous sight, the owlet, atheism, sailing on obscure wings athwart the noon, drops his blue fringed lids and holds them close, and hooting at the glorious sun in heaven, cries out, Where is it? Thankless too for peace peace long preserved by fleets and perilous seas, secure from actual warfare, we have loved to swell the war-whoop, passionate for war. Alas, for ages, ignorant of all its ghastlier workings, famine or blue plague, battle or siege, or flight through wintry snows, we, this whole people, have been clamorous for war and bloodshed, animating sports, the which we pay for as a thing to talk of, spectators and not combatants no guess anticipative of a wrong unfelt no speculation on contingency however dim and vague too vague and dim to yield a justifying cause and forth stuffed out with big preamble holy names and adjurations of the god in heaven we send our mandates for the certain death of thousands and ten thousands boys and girls and women that would groan to see a child pull off an insect's wing. All read of war, the best amusement for our morning meal. The poor wretch, who has learnt his only prayers from curses, and who knows scarcely words enough to ask a blessing from his heavenly Father, becomes a fluent phraseman, absolute and technical in victories and defeats, and all our dainty terms for fratricide terms which we trundle smoothly o'er our tongues like mere abstractions empty sounds to which we join no feeling and attach no form as if the soldier died without a wound as if the fibres of this godlike frame were gored without a pang as if the wretch who fell in battle doing bloody deeds passed off to heaven translated and not killed as though he had no wife to pine for him no god to judge him Therefore, evil days are coming on us, O oh my countrymen. And what if all avenging providence, strong and retributive, should make us know the meaning of our words, force us to feel the desolation and the agony of our fierce doings? Spare us yet a while, Father and God. O oh, spare us yet a while. O oh, let not English women drag their flight fainting beneath the burden of their babes of the sweet infants that but yesterday laughed at the breast sons brothers husbands all who ever gazed with fondness on the forms which grew up with you round the same fireside and who ever heard the sabbath bells without the infidel scorn make yourself pure stand forth be men repel an impious foe impious and false a light yet cruel race who laugh away all virtue mingling mirth with deeds of murder, and still promising freedom, themselves too sensual to be free, poison life's amities, and cheat the heart of faith and quiet hope, and all that soothes, and all that lifts the spirit. Stand we forth, render them back upon the insulted ocean, and let them toss as idly on its waves as the vile seaweed which some mountain blast swept from our shores. And, oh, may we return, not with a drunken triumph, but with fear, repenting of the wrongs with which we stung so fierce a foe to frenzy. I have told, O oh Britons, O oh my brethren, I have told most bitter truth, but without bitterness. 
nor deem my zeal or factious or mistimed for never can true courage dwell with them who playing tricks with conscience dare not look at their own vices we have been too long dupes of a deep delusion some belike groaning with restless enmity expect all change from change of constituted power as if a government had been a robe of which our vice and wretchedness were tagged like fancy points and fringes with the robe pulled off at pleasure fondly these attach a radical causation to a few poor drudges of chastising providence who borrow all their hues and qualities from our own folly and rank wickedness which gave them birth and nursed them others meanwhile dote with a mad idolatry and all who will not fall before their images and yield them worship they are enemies even of their own country such have i been deemed but o oh dear britain o oh my mother isle needs must thou prove a name most dear and holy to me a son a brother and a friend a husband and a father who revere all bonds of natural love and find them all within the limits of thy rocky shores o oh native britain o oh my mother isle how shouldst thou prove aught else but dear and holy to me who from thy lakes and mountain hills thy clouds thy quiet dales thy rocks and seas have drunk in all my intellectual life all sweet sensations all ennobling thoughts all adoration of god in nature all lovely and all honourable things whatever makes this mortal spirit feel the joy and greatness of its future being there lives nor form nor feeling in my soul unborrowed from my country o divine and beauteous island thou hast been my sole and most magnificent temple in the which i walk with awe and sing my stately songs loving the god that made me may my fears my filial fears be vain and may the vaunts and menace of the vengeful enemy pass like the gust that roared and died away in the distant tree which heard and only heard in this low dell bowed not the delicate grass but now the gentle dewfall sends abroad the fruit-like perfume of the golden firs the light has left the summit of the hill though still a sunny gleam lies beautiful as slant the ivied beacon now farewell farewell awhile o soft and silent spot on the green sheep track up the healthy hill homeward i wind my way and lo recalled from bodings that have well nigh wearied me i find myself upon the brow and pause startled and after lonely sojourning in such a quiet and surrounded nook this burst of prospect here the shadowy main dim tinted there the mighty majesty of that huge amphitheatre of rich and elmy fields seems like society conversing with the mind and giving it a livelier impulse and a dance of thought and now beloved stoey i behold thy church tower and methinks the four huge elms clustering which mark the mansion of my friend and close behind them hidden from my view is my own lowly cottage where my babe and my babe's mother dwell in peace with light and quickened footsteps thitherward i tend remembering thee o green and silent dell and grateful that by nature's quietness and solitary musings all my heart is softened and made worthy to indulge love and the thoughts that yearn for humankind end of poem this recording is in the public domain Hesperia by Elgin and Charles Swinburne Read for LibriVox.org by Cusper Nyssen Out of the golden remote wild west Where the sea without shore is Full of the sunset And sad if at all with the fullness of joy As a wind sets in with the autumn That blows from the region of stories Blows with the perfume of songs And of memories beloved from a boy blows from the capes of the past over sea to the bays of the present filled as with shadow of sound with the pearls of invisible feet far out to the shallows and straits of the future by rough ways or pleasant 
Is it thither the wind's wings beat? Is it hither to me, O my sweet? For thee, in the stream of the deep tide wind blowing in with the water, thee I behold as a bird borne in with the wind from the west, straight from the sunset, across wide waves whence rose as a daughter Venus thy mother, in years when the world was a water at rest. Out of the distance of dreams, as a dream that abides after slumber, straight from the fugitive flock of the night, when the moon overhead wanes in the one waste heights of the heaven, and stars without number die without sound, and are spent like lamps that are burnt by the dead, comes back to me, stays by me, lulls me with touch of forgotten caresses, one warm dream clad about with a fire as of life that endures, the delight of thy face, and the sound of thy feet, and the wind of thy tresses, and all of a man that regrets, and all of a maid that allures, but thy bosom is warm for my face, and profound as a manifold flower, thy silence as music, thy voice as an odor that fades in a flame, not a dream, not a dream is the kiss of thy mouth, and the bountiful hour that makes me forget what was sin, and would make me forget were it shame. Thine eyes that are quiet, thy hands that are tender, thy lips that are loving, comfort and cool me as dew in the dawn of a moon like a dream. And my heart yearns baffled and blind, moved vainly toward thee, and moving as the refluent seaweed moves in the languid exuberant stream. Fair as a rose is on earth, as a rose under water in prison, that stretches and swings to the slow passionate pulse of the sea, closed up from the air and the sun, but alive as a ghost re-arisen, pale as the love that revives as a ghost re-arisen in me. From the bountiful infinite west, from the happy memorial places, full of the stately repose and the lordly delight of the dead, where the fortunate islands are lit with the light of ineffable faces, and the sound of a sea without wind is about them, and sunset is red. Come back to redeem and release me from love that recalls and represses, that cleaves to my flesh as a flame, till the serpent has eaten his fill. From the bitter delights of the dark, and the feverish, the furtive caresses that murder the youth in a man, or ever his heart have its will. Thy lips cannot laugh, and thine eyes cannot weep. Thou art pale as a rose is, paler and sweeter than leaves that cover the blush of the bud. For the heart of a flower is compassion, and pity the core it encloses, pity, not love, that is born of the breath and decays with the blood. As the cross that a wild nun clasps, till the edge of it bruises her bosom, so love wounds as we grasp it, and blackens and burns as a flame. I have loved over much in my life, when the live bud bursts with the blossom, bitter as ashes or tears is the fruit, and the wine thereof shame. As a heart that its anguish divides, is the green bud cloven asunder, as the blood of a man self-slain, is the flush of the leaves that allure, and the perfume as poison and wine to the brain, a delight and a wonder, and the thorns are too sharp for a boy, too slight for a man to endure. Too soon did I love it, and lost love's rose, and I cared not for glories. Only the blossoms of sleep and of pleasure were mixed in my hair. Was it myrtle or poppy thy garland was woven with, O oh my Dolores? Was it pallor or slumber, or blush as of blood? that I found in thee fair. 
for desire is a respite from love, and the flesh, not the heart, is her fuel. She was sweet to me once, who am fled and escaped from the rage of her reign, who behold as of old time at hand as I turn, with her mouth growing cruel, and flushed as with wine with the blood of her lovers, our lady of pain. Lo, down where the thicket is thicker with thorns than with leaves in the summer. In the brake is a gleaning of eyes, and a hissing of tongues that I knew, and the light long throats of her snakes reach round her, their mouth overcome her, and her lips grow cool with their foam, made moist as a desert with dew, with the thirst and the hunger of lust, though her beautiful lips be so bitter. With the cold, foul foam of the snakes, they soften and redden and smile, and her fierce mouth sweetens, her eyes wax white and her eyelashes glitter, and she laughs with a savour of blood in her face and a savour of guile. She laughs, and her hands reach hither, her hair blows hither and hisses as a low-lit flame in a wind, back blown till it shudder and leap. Let her lips not again lay hold on my soul, nor her poisonous kisses, to consume it alive and divide from thy bosom, our lady of sleep. Ah, daughter of sunset and slumber, if now it return into prison, who shall redeem it anew? But we, if thou wilt, let us fly, let us take to us, now that the white skies thrill with the moon unarisen, Swift horses of fear or of love, take flight and depart and not die. They are swifter than dreams, they are stronger than death. There is none that hath ridden, none that shall ride in the dim strange ways of his life as we ride. By the meadows of memory, the highlands of hope, and the shore that is hidden, where life breaks loud and unseen a sonorous invisible tide. By the sands where sorrow has trodden, the salt pools bitter and sterile, by the thundering reef and the low sea wall and the channel of years, our wild steeds press on the night, strain hard through pleasure and peril, labour and listen and pant not or pause for the peril that nears and the sound of them trampling the way cleaves night as an arrow asunder, and slow by the sand hill and swift by the down with its glimpses of grass, sudden and steady the music, as eight hoofs trample and thunder, rings in the ear of the low blind wind of the night as we pass, shrill shrieks in our faces the blind bland air that was mute as a maiden, Stung into storm by the speed of our passage, and deaf where we passed, and our spirits too burn as we bound, thine holy but mine heavy laden, as we burn with the fire of our flight, our love shall we win at the last. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The General by Siegfried Sassoon Recorded for LibriVox.org by Michael Dowling Good morning, good morning, the General said When we met him last week on our way to the line The other soldiers he smiled at and most of them dead And we're cursing his staff for incompetent swine He's a cheery old card, grunted Harry to Jack As they slogged up to Arras with rifle and pack But he did for them both by his plan of attack. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The House with Nobody in It by Joyce Kilmer. Read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. Whenever I walked to Suffern along the eerie track, I go by a poor old farmhouse with its shingles broken and black. 
I suppose I've passed it a hundred times, but I always stop for a minute and look at the house, the tragic house, the house with nobody in it. I never have seen a haunted house, but I hear there are such things, that they hold the talk of spirits, their mirth and sorrowings. I know this house isn't haunted, and I wish it were, I do, for it wouldn't be so lonely if it had a ghost or two. This house on the road to Suffern needs a dozen panes of glass, and somebody ought to weed the walk and take a scythe to the grass. It needs new paint and shingles, and the vines should be trimmed and tied. But what it needs the most of all is some people living inside. Now, if I had a lot of money and all my debts were paid, I'd put a gang of men to work with brush and saw and spade. I'd buy that place and fix it up the way it used to be. And I'd find some people who wanted a home and give it to them free. Now a new house, standing empty, with staring window and door, looks idle, perhaps, and foolish, like a hat on its block in the store. But there's nothing mournful about it. It cannot be sad and lone for the lack of something within it that it has never known. But a house that has done what a house should do, a house that has sheltered life, that has put its loving wooden arms around a man and his wife, a house that has echoed a baby's laugh and held up his stumbling feet, is the saddest sight when it's left alone that ever your eyes could meet. So whenever I go to suffer and along the eerie track, I never go by the empty house without stopping and looking back. Yet it hurts me to look at the crumbling roof and the shutters fallen apart for i can't help thinking the poor old house is a house with a broken heart and a poem this recording is in the public domain in the garret by louisa may alcott Read for LibriVox.org by Cress. Four little chests all in a row, Dim with dust and worn by time, All fashioned and filled long ago By children now in their prime. Four little keys hung side by side With faded ribbons, brave and gay, When fastened there with childish pride Long ago on a rainy day, four little names one on each lid carved out by a boyish hand and underneath there lieth hid histories of the happy band once playing here and pausing oft to hear the sweet refrain that came and went on the roof aloft in the falling summer rain meg on the first lid smooth and fair i look in with loving eyes for folded here with well-known care a goodly gathering lies the record of a peaceful life gifts to gentle child and girl a bridal gown lines to a wife a tiny shoe a baby curl no toys in this first chest remain for all are carried away in their old age to join again in another small meg's play ah happy mother well i know you hear like a sweet refrain lullabies ever soft and low in the falling summer rain joe on the next lid scratched and worn and within a motley store of headless dolls of school books torn birds and beasts that spark no more spoils brought me home from the fairy ground only trod by youthful feet dreams of a future never found memories of a past still sweet half writ poems stories wild april letters warm and cold diaries of a wilful child hints of a woman early old a woman in a lonely home hearing like a sad refrain 
be worthy love and love will come in the falling summer rain my beth the dust is always swept from the lid that bears your name as if by loving eyes that wept by careful hands that often came death canonized for us one saint ever less human than divine and still we lay with tender plaint relics in this household shrine the silver bell so seldom rung the little cap which last she wore the fair dead catherine that hung by angels born above her door the song she sang without lament in her prison house of pain forever are they sweetly blent with the falling summer rain upon the last lid's polished field legend now both fair and true a gallant knight bears on his shield amy in letters gold and blue within lie snoods that bound her hair slippers that have danced their last faded flowers laid by with care fans those airy toils are past gay valentines all ardent flames trifles that have borne their part in girlish hopes and fears and shames the record of a maiden heart now leaning fairer truer spells hearing like a blithe refrain the silver sound of bridal bells in the falling summer rain four little chests all in a row dim with dust and worn by time four women taught by weal and woe to love and labor in their prime four sisters parted for an hour none lost one only gone before made by love's immortal power nearest and dearest evermore oh when these hidden stores of ours lie open to the father's sight may they be rich in golden hours deeds that show fairer for the light lives whose brave music long shall ring like a spirit stirring strain souls that shall gladly soar and sing in the long sunshine after rain end of poem this recording is in the public domain the lady of shalott by alfred lord tennyson read for LibriVox.org by elizabeth clett part one on either side the river lie long fields of barley and of rye that clothe the wold and meet the sky and through the field the road runs by to many towered camelot and up and down the people go gazing where the lilies blow round an island there below the island of shalott willows whiten aspens quiver little breezes dusk and shiver through the wave that runs forever by the island in the river flowing down to camelot four gray walls and four gray towers overlook a space of flowers and the silent isle embowers the lady of shalott by the margin willow veiled slide the heavy barges trailed by slow horses and unhailed the shallop flitteth silken sailed skimming down to camelot but who hath seen her wave her hand or at the casement seen her stand or is she known in all the land the lady of shalott only reapers reaping early in among the bearded barley hear a song that echoes cheerly from the river winding clearly down to towered camelot and by the moon the reaper weary piling sheaves in uplands airy listening whispers tis the fairy lady of shalott part two there she weaves by night and day a magic web with colours gay she has heard a whisper say a curse is on her if she stay to look down to camelot she knows not what the curse may be and so she weaveth steadily and little other care hath she the lady of shalott and moving through a mirror clear that hangs before her all the year shadows of the world appear 
there she sees the highway near winding down to Camelot. There the river eddy whirls, and there the surly village churls, and the red cloaks of market girls pass onward from Shalott. Sometimes a troop of damsels glad, an abbot on an ambling pad, sometimes a curly shepherd lad, or long-haired page in crimson clad, goes by to towered Camelot. And sometimes through the mirror blue the knights come riding two and two, she hath no loyal knight and true, the Lady of Shalott. But in her web she still delights to weave the mirror's magic sights, for often through the silent nights a funeral with plumes and lights and music went to Camelot. Or when the moon was overhead came two young lovers lately wed. I am half sick of shadows, said the Lady of Shalott. Part three. A bow-shot from her bower eaves, he rode between the barley sheaves, the sun came dazzling through the leaves, and flamed upon the brazen greaves of bold Sir Lancelot. A red-cross knight for ever kneeled to a lady in his shield that sparkled on the yellow field beside remote Shalott. All in the blue unclouded weather thick-jewelled shone the saddle-leather, the helmet and the helmet feather burned like one burning flame together as he rode down to Camelot. As often through the purple night below the starry clusters bright, some bearded meteor trailing light moves over still Shalott. His broad clear brow in sunlight glowed, on burnished hooves his war-horse trode, from underneath his helmet flowed his coal-black curls as on he rode, as he rode down to Camelot. From the bank and from the river he flashed into the crystal mirror, Tiralira by the river sang Sir Lancelot. She left the web, she left the loom, she made three paces through the room, she saw the water-lily bloom, she saw the helmet and the plume, she looked down to Camelot. Out flew the web and floated wide, the mirror cracked from side to side, the curse has come upon me, cried the Lady of Shalott. Part Four. In the stormy east wind straining, the pale yellow woods were waning, the broad stream in his banks complaining, heavily the low sky raining over towered Camelot. Down she came and found a boat beneath a willow left afloat, and round about the prow she wrote the Lady of Shalott. And down the river's dim expanse, like some bold seer in a trance, seeing all his own mischance, with a glassy countenance did she look to Camelot. And at the closing of the day she loosed the chain, and down she lay, the broad stream bore her far away the Lady of Shalott. Lying robed in snowy white that loosely flew to left and right, the leaves upon her falling light, through the noises of the night she floated down to Camelot. And as the boathead wound along, the willowy hills and fields among, they heard her singing her last song, the Lady of Shalott. Heard a carol, mournful, holy, chanted loudly, chanted lowly, till her blood was frozen slowly, and her eyes were darkened wholly, turned to towered Camelot. For ere she reached upon the tide, the first house by the waterside, singing in her song she died, the Lady of Shalott. Under tower and balcony, by garden wall and gallery, a gleaming shape she floated by, dead pale between the houses high, silent into Camelot. Out upon the wharfs they came, knight and burgher, lord and dame, and around the prow they read her name, the Lady of Shalott. Who is this, and what is here? And in the lighted palace near died the sound of royal cheer, and they crossed themselves for fear all the knights at Camelot. But Lancelot mused a little space. He said, She has a lovely face. God in his mercy lend her grace. The Lady of Shalott. 
End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Last Quarter of the Moon by Amy Lowell. Read for LibriVox.org by Amanda Brewer. How long shall I tarnish the mirror of life, a spatter of rust on its polished steel? The seasons reel like a goaded wheel, half numb, half maddened, my days are strife. The night is sliding towards the dawn, and upturned hills crouch at autumn's knees. A torn moon flees through the hemlock trees. The hours have gnawed it to feed their spawn. Pursuing and jeering the misshapen thing, a rabble of clouds flares out of the east. Like dogs unleashed after a beast, they stream on the sky, an outflung string. A desolate wind through the unpeopled dark shakes the bushes and whistles through empty nests and the fierce unrests I keep as guests, crowd my brain with corpses, pallid and stark. Leave me in peace, O spectress, who haunt my laboring mind. I have fought and failed, I have not quailed. I was all unmailed, and naked I strove, tis my only vaunt. The moon drops into the silver day, as waking out of her swoon she comes. I hear the drums of millenniums, beating the mornings I still must stay. The years I must watch go in and out while I build with water and dig in air, and the trumpets blare, hollow despair, the shuddering trumpets of utter rout. An atom tossed in a chaos made of yeasting worlds which bubble and foam. Whence have I come? What would be home? I hear no answer. I am afraid. I crave to be lost like a wind-blown flame, pushed into nothingness by a breath, and quench in a wreath of engulfing death this fight for a god or this devil's game. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Leave Taking by Elgin and Charles Swinburne Read for LibriVox.org by Casper Nyssen Let us go hence, my songs, she will not hear. Let us go hence together without fear. Keep silence now, for singing time is over, And over all old things, and all things dear. She loves not you nor me, as all we love her. Yeah, though we sang as angels in her ear, she would not hear. Let us rise up and part, she will not know. Let us go seaward as the great winds go, full of blown sand and foam. What help is here? There is no help. For all these things are so, And all the world is bitter as a tear. And how these things are, Though he strove to show, She would not know. Let us go home and hence, She will not weep. We gave love many dreams and days to keep, Flowers without scent, And fruits that would not grow saying if thou wilt thrust in thy sickle and reap all is reaped now no grass is left to mow and we that sowed though all we fell on sleep she would not weep let us go hence and rest she will not love she shall not hear us if we sing hereof nor see love's ways how sore they are and steep. Come hence, let be, lie still, it is enough. Love is a barren sea, bitter and deep. And though she saw all heaven in flower above, she would not love. Let us give up, go down, 
she will not care though all the stars made gold of all the air and the sea moving saw before it move one moon flower making all the foam flowers fair though all those waves went over us and drove deep down the stifling lips and the rounding hair she would not care let us go hence go hence she will not see sing all once more together surely she she too remembering days and words that were will turn a little toward us sighing but we we are hence we are gone as though we had not been there nay and though all man seeing had pity on me she would not see End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Lines composed in a wood on a windy day by Anne Bronte. Read for LibriVox.org by Denise Blake. My soul is awakened, my spirit is soaring, and carried aloft on the wings of the breeze. For above and around me the wild wind is roaring, arousing to rapture the earth and the seas. The long withered grass in the sunshine is glancing. The bare trees are tossing their branches on high. The dead leaves beneath them are merrily dancing. The white clouds are scudding against the blue sky. I wish I could see how the ocean is lashing, the foam of its billows to whirlwinds of spray. I wish I could see how its proud waves are dashing, and hear the wild roar of their thunder today. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. On the Eclipse of the Moon of October 1865 by Charles Turner Read for LibriVox.org by Rhonda Fetterman One little noise of life remained. I heard the train pause in the distance, then rush by, brawling and hushing like some busy fly that murmurs and then settles. Nothing stirred beside. The shadow of our travelling earth hung on the silver moon, which mutely went through that grand process, without token scent or any sign to call a gazer forth, had I not chanced to see. Dumb was the vault of heaven, and dumb the fields, no zephyr swept the forest walks or through the coppice crept nor other sound the stillness did assault save that faint brawling railways move and halt so perfect was the silence nature kept end of poem this recording's in the public domain The Pains of Sleep by Samuel Taylor Coleridge Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug Perth, Western Australia Ere on my bed my limbs I lay It hath not been my use to pray With moving lips or bended knees But silently, by slow degrees My spirit I to love compose In humble trust mine eyelids close With reverential resignation No wish conceived, no thought expressed only a sense of supplication, a sense o'er all my soul impressed, that I am weak, yet not unblessed, since in me, round me, everywhere eternal strength and wisdom are. But yesternight I prayed aloud in anguish and in agony, upstarting from the fiendish crowd of shapes and thoughts that tortured me. A lurid light, a trampling throng, sense of intolerable wrong, and whom I scorned those only strong. Thirst of revenge, the powerless will, still baffled, and yet burning still. Desire with loathing, strangely mixed, on wild or hateful objects fixed. Fantastic passions, maddening brawl, and shame and terror over all. Deeds to be hid, which were not hid, which all confused I could not know whether I suffered or I did. 
for all seemed guilt, remorse, or woe, my own or others still the same life-stifling fear, soul-stifling shame. So two nights passed, the night's dismay saddened and stunned the coming day. Sleep, the wide blessing, seemed to me distemper's worst calamity. The third night, when my own loud scream had waked me from the fiendish dream, or come with suffering strange and wild, I wept as I had been a child. And having thus by tears subdued my anguish to a milder mood, such punishments, I said, were due to nature's deepliest stain with sin. For I, in tempesting anew the unfathomable hell within, the horror of their deeds to view, to know and loathe, yet wish and do, such griefs with such men well agree, but wherefore, wherefore fall on me? To be beloved is all I need, and whom I love, I love indeed. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Recognition by Johann Nepomuk Vogel Translated by Margaret Münsterberg Recorded for LibriVox.org by Renata March 2012, Colorado A wandering youth with a cane in his hand Comes home again from a foreign land. His hair is dusty, his face is brown. Who will know him first in a little town? He enters the town by the ancient gate at the toll by leans a former maid. The publican once was a cherished friend, gay hours at the tavern they used to spend. But see, his old comrade knows him not. His face is so sunburned that he is forgot. The youth wanders on with a greeting fleet and shakes off the dust from his tired feet. From a window his love looks with gentle eyes, be welcome, O oh, loveliest maiden, he cries. See, even the maiden knows him not. His face is so sunburned that he is forgot. So on he is strolling across the town. A tear gleams bright on his cheek so brown. There tutters his mother from the church door. God bless you, he says, and nothing more. But see, his old mother is sobbing with joy. My son, and she sings on the breast of her boy. No matter how sunburn his face has grown, by a mother's eye he is straightway known. End of poem. This poem is in the public domain. The Remorse of the Dead by Charles Baudelaire Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp. O shadowy beauty mine, when thou shalt sleep in the deep heart of a black marble tomb, when thou for mansion and for bower shalt keep only one rainy cave of hollow gloom, and when the stone upon thy trembling breast and on thy straight sweet body's supple grace crushes thy will and keeps thy heart at rest and holds those feet from their adventurous race then the deep grave who shares my reverie for the deep grave is i the poet's friend during long nights when sleep is far from thee shall whisper ah thou didst not comprehend the dead wept thus thou woman frail and weak and like remorse the worm shall gnaw thy cheek. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Shiloh, a Requiem by Herman Melville Read for LibriVox.org by Lubet skimming lightly wheeling still the swallows fly low over the fields in clouded days the forest field of shiloh over the field where april rain solaced the parched one stretched in pain through the pause of night that followed the sunday fight around the church of shiloh the church so lone the log-built one 
that echo to many a parting groan and natural prayer. Of dying foemen mingled there, foemen at morn but friends at eve, fame or country least their care, what like a bullet can undeceive? But now they lie low, while over them the swallows skim, and all is hushed at Shiloh. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. St. Patrick's Purgatory by Robert Southey Read for LibriVox.org by Noel Badrian, County Offaly, Ireland Enter, Sir Knight, the warden cried, and trust in heaven what e'er betide, since you have reached this burn. But first receive refreshment due, twill then be time to welcome you, if ever you return. Three sops were brought of bread and wine. Well might Sir Owen then divine the mystic warning given, that he against our ghostly foe must soon to mortal combat go and put his trust in heaven. Sir Owen passed the convent gate, the warden him conducted straight to where a coffin lay. The monks around in silence stand, each with a funeral torch in hand, whose light be dimmed the day. Few pilgrims ever reach this bourn, they said, but fewer still return, yet let what will ensue. Our duties are prescribed and clear. Put off all mortal weakness here, this coffin is for you. Lie there, while we with pious breath raise over you the dirge of death, this comfort we can give. Belike no living hands may pay this office to your lifeless clay. Receive it while you live. Sir Owen in a shroud was dressed, they placed a cross upon his breast, and down he laid his head. Around him stood the funeral train, and sung with slow and solemn strain the service of the dead. Then to the entrance of the cave they led the Christian warrior brave. Some fear he well might feel, for none of all the monks could tell the terrors of that mystic cell, its secrets none reveal. Now enter here, the warden cried, and God, Sir Owen, be your guide. Your name shall live in story, for of the few who reach this shore, still fewer venture to explore St. Patrick's Purgatory. Adown the cavern's long descent, feeling his way, Sir Owen went, with cautious feet and slow, unarmed, for neither sword nor spear, nor shield of proof availed him here against our ghostly foe. The ground was moist beneath his tread, large drops fell heavy on his head the air was damp and chill and sudden shudderings o'er him came and he could feel through all his frame an icy sharpness thrill now steeper grew the dark descent in fervent prayer the pilgrim went twas silence all around save his own echo from the cell and the large drops that frequent fell with dull and heavy sound but colder now he felt the cell those heavy drops no longer fell thin grew the piercing air and now upon his aching sight there dawned far off a feeble light in hope he hastened there emerging now once more to-day a frozen waste before him lay a desert wild and wide where ice rocks in a sunless sky on ice rocks piled and mountains high were heaped on every side impending as about to fall they seemed and had that sight been all enough that sight had been to make the stoutest courage quail for what could courage there avail against what then was seen he saw as on in faith he passed where many a frozen wretch was fast within the ice clefts pent yet living still and doomed to bear in absolute and dumb despair their endless punishment a voice then spake within his ear and filled his inmost soul with fear 
O oh, mortal man, it said, adventurers like thyself were these. He seemed to feel his life-blood freeze, and yet subdued his dread. O oh, mortal man, the voice pursued, be wise in time, for thine own good alone I counsel thee. Take pity on thyself, retrace thy steps, and fly this dolorous place, while yet thy feet are free. I warn thee once, I warn thee twice, behold that mass of mountain ice is trembling o'er thy head, one warning is allowed thee more, O mortal man, that warning o'er, and thou art worse than dead. Not without fear, Sir Owen still held on with strength of righteous will, in faith and fervent prayer. When at the word, I warn thee thrice, down came the mass of mountain ice, and o'erwhelmed him there. Crushed though it seemed in every bone, and sense for suffering left alone, a living hope remained, in whom he had believed he knew, and thence the holy courage grew, that still his soul sustained. For he, as he beheld it fall, failed not in faith on Christ to call, lord thou canst save he cried o heavenly help vouchsafed in need when perfect faith is found indeed the rocks of ice divide like dust before the storm winds sway the shivered fragments rolled away and left the passage free new strength he feels all pain is gone new life sir owen breathes and on he goes rejoicingly yet other trials he must meet for soon a close and piercing heat relaxed each loosened limb the sweat streamed out from every part in short quick beatings toiled his heart his throbbing eyes grew dim along the wide and wasted land a stream of fire through banks of sand its molten billows spread thin vapours tremulously light hung quivering o'er the glowing white the air he breathed was red. A paradise beyond was seen, Of shady groves and gardens green, Fair flowers and fruitful trees, And flowing fountains cool and clear, Whose gurgling music reached his ear, Borne on the burning breeze. How should he pass that molten flood? While gazing wistfully he stood, a fiend as in a dream thus answered the unuttered thought stretched forth a mighty arm and caught and cast him in the stream sir owen groaned for then he felt his eyeballs burn his marrow melt his brain like liquid lead and from his heart the boiling blood its agonizing course pursued through limbs like iron red yet giving way to no despair but mindful of the aid of prayer lord thou canst save he said and then a breath from eden came with life and healing through his frame the blissful influence spread no fiends may now his way oppose the gates of paradise unclose free entrance there is given and songs of triumph meet his ear enwrapped sir owen seems to hear the harmonies of heaven come pilgrim take thy foretaste meet thou who hast trod with fearless feet st patrick's purgatory for after death these seats divine reward eternal shall be thine and thine eternal glory inebriate with the deep delight dim grew the pilgrim's swimming sight his senses died away and when to life he woke before the cabin mouth he saw once more the light of earthly day end of poem this recording is in the public domain to rosamond by edith nesbit read for librivox.org by martin geeson and it is fair and very fair this maze of blossom and sweet air this drift of orchard snows 
this royal promise of the rose wherein your young eyes see such buds of scented joys to be a gay green garden softly fanned by the blithe breeze that blows to speed your ship of dreams to the enchanted land but i beyond the budding screen of green and red and white and green behind the radiant show of things that cling and grow and glow i see the plains where lie the hopes of days gone by grey breadths of melancholy crossed by winds that coldly blow from that cold sea wherein my argosy is lost end of poem this recording is in the public domain to rosamunde by geoffrey chaucer read for LibriVox.org by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey madame ye ben of al beote shrine as fair a circle is the mappa munde for as the crystal glorious ye shine and lika rube ben your cheques runde therewith ye ben so miri and so jocunde that at a revel one that he say you dance it is an ornament unto me wound though yet men do no dalliance for though he weep of tears full a teen yet my that woe mine heart not confunde your seemly voice that ye so small out tween maketh me thought in joy and bliss a boond so courteously he go with love boond that to myself he sigh in me penance sufficeth me to love you rosamunde doch ye to me ne do no dalliance nas never peak wallowed in galantine as he in love am wallowed and he wound for which full oft he of myself divine that he am trewe tristam the secunde me love my not refried be nor afunde i bren a in an amorous pleasance do what you list i will your thrall be found though yet o me ne do no dalliance pre gentil chaucer end of poem this recording is in the public domain